Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. Last time we began a new cycle of lectures about the indigenous civilizations of the Americas and how they were impacted by the Spanish conquest. We began with the Mayans of Central America, who peaked between 200 and 980, long before the Spanish came on the scene, and whose collapse was most likely caused by internal war and environmental issues, not the Spanish conquest. Well, today we'll move to a different corner of the Caribbean, the islands themselves, to study a group, the Tainos, who were far more directly impacted by the Spanish conquest. The Tainos are not as famous as the Mayans, or the Aztecs, and the Inca that we'll study next, because, well, they didn't build impressive stone monuments like the others. But they were the first Native Americans encountered by the European invaders of the New World, uh, so it's worth saying a few things about them, because what happened to the Tainos and it was pretty tragic. Well, that was a template for what eventually happened to everyone else in the Americas. The Tainos, who are also known as the Arawaks, were quite different ethnically from the Mayans. Uh, they did not come from Central America, the Mayans or the Aztecs. They originally came from the Amazon rainforest of South America. And from there, they migrated north along the chain of islands that you see on that map over there by using the prevailing winds and the currents, which generally push you from the southeast to the northwest in that region of the world. That's called the, the trade winds, the same dominant winds that carried Columbus across the Atlantic. If you ever wondered why there is a string of Caribbean islands right there, aligned one after the other, well, geology is the reason. Several tectonic plates meet in the Caribbean, so at the juncture of these plates, lava has a tendency to spew out and create volcanoes. All the islands that you see on the map are centered on volcanoes, some of which are still active today. I was born in the island of Guadeloupe, so I'll give a special shout out to the volcano of La Soufrière, which almost blew up in 1976, the year I was born. Uh, but there are plenty of other volcanoes in the region. The ones in Montserrat and Martinique have been quite active recently. By recently, I mean in the past 100 years. So, because of those tectonic plates, you have volcanoes and earthquakes too, uh, like the terrible one that shook Haiti in 2010. But the trade winds, they also bring hurricanes as well. Uh, the hurricanes that hit us in Louisiana right here, usually they form in the Atlantic, and they devastate the Caribbean islands before they get to us. So, you might think that the Caribbean islands, aka the Antilles, they would not be a favorable environment for human settlement because of the volcanoes and all that other stuff. And you'd be wrong. Uh, volcanoes are typically surrounded by very rich soil, so humans often congregate on their slopes despite the risks. Uh, the Caribbean is also located in a tropical region, so temperatures are warm year-round, and rain is usually abundant because of the trade winds that are blowing in from the Atlantic and bring moisture. So with good soil, tropical temperatures, and plenty of rain, the Tainos could easily grow local crops on Caribbean islands. And by local crops, I mean corn, the staple crop of the Americas, but also yams and cassava, which are starch-rich roots, as well as cotton and tobacco. All the crops that you might associate with the Caribbean, like sugarcane, coffee, bananas, these are not native to the area. They were introduced by the Spanish after the conquest. The Taino did not grow them. When we studied medieval Europe, a key feature of agriculture was the open field, that large area where farmers would plow long furrows using a heavy steel plow and a horse. Well, none of that was a norm in the pre-colonial Caribbean. Uh, there were no horses or oxen to begin with, or steel for that matter, and the hilly terrain of the island that was not conducive to plowing. So instead the Tainos would build conucos, which were simply little mounds of dirt, uh, where they would poke a hole using a wooden stick and then plant yams or cassava. Uh, very low, uh, very low tech, but very effective. Because this way there was no need to cut all the trees, the tiny would simply plant a few mounds here and there in small clearings. And that had the effect of reducing the risk of deforestation and soil erosion, which are real problems in modern Caribbean countries like Haiti uh, today. Animal husbandry, that was more limited. Uh, there are very few large animals that are native to the Caribbean, except for iguanas and such. Uh, so the Taino diet was usually short on protein, except for whatever they could fish from the sea. Aside from that, Taino agriculture was extremely efficient. 
uh, scholars have estimated that one hour of agricultural labor a day, that was enough to feed one's family, which left plenty of free time to do other stuff. So, what did the Tainos do with all that free time, you might ask? Well, some architecture, but nothing on the scale of the monuments that we encountered in the Mayan world last time, or that we encountered in Mexico or Peru. Uh, the Tainos built some huts out of wood and palm fronds, as well as some large enclosures that are known as bates, which they used to play a ball game. And it's not clear whether this game was similar to the Mayan ball game that we encountered last time, or something different altogether, closer to soccer today, uh, because we only know of the game by looking at the bates, those physical remnants of the pitches where the game was played, and those are very impressive. Or we know of them through the accounts by Spanish invaders, but we're left with a big question mark as to what that ball game was really about. Which might be a good time to talk about the sources that we're dealing with today because they are very problematic. Contrary to the Mayas and the Aztecs of Central America, the Tainos, they had no writing system. So we can't read a single document written by them, only a few drawings that they carved into the stone. And illiterate people tend to have a rich oral culture to compensate, and the Tainos did, as a stage place that they called aretos, which were a way to entertain themselves, but also to remember their creation myths, and also, well, their history in general, like the griots of West Africa, if you will. But to preserve oral history, you need living people, and the Tainos, spoiler alert, ceased to exist as an organized people after the Spanish conquest. So you can't go to the Caribbean today and ask local Tainos to stage an areto for you so that you can learn about their past through oral traditions. They're gone. When the written record is non-existent, the archaeological record can be another crutch for historians. But the Tainos, they built fairly few things, often out of perishable materials like wood, uh, which have long since vanished in a tropical climate. Uh, so another dead end there. It's not like we have a great Zimbabwe or a Persepolis capital to dig through, none of that there. So the results, historians rely quasi-exclusively on outside written accounts written by the Spanish conquistadors, i.e. the very people who came to the Caribbean to conquer and enslave the Tainos, which is far from ideal. Imagine if, when I did my lecture on the history of the Jews in section two, I had relied exclusively on accounts by Hitler and Goebbels uh, because I did not have a copy of the Old Testament with me. So a major problem there. Uh, we will discuss that further when we do the class discussion, uh, because as you'll see when we do that discussion, all the documents in the primary source reader, they are by Spanish writers, many of whom wrote disparaging comments about the Tainos, but that's what we have to work with. Even the Spanish authors who were well-intentioned, like Bartolomé de las Casas, they faced a major linguistic barrier. They had to translate terms from an alien tongue into Spanish, and they often struggled to get it right. Even the word Tainos, uh, that came from a misunderstanding. When Columbus first encountered the Tainos in the Bahamas, he asked them who they were, and they responded, I am Taino, which meant I am a noble, since, well, he met the local aristocrats. Uh, but Columbus thought that the term applied to the people as a whole, not just the elite, and he called everybody a Taino, and the name has stuck. Speaking of words, how many tiny words do you know? Think about it for a sec. None? Actually, you know more than you think. The Spanish, they borrowed many Taino terms to describe unfamiliar things that they encountered in the New World, and those words eventually made their way into English. So the Spanish would ask, what is that strange dugout boat over there that you use to go from island to island? Kanawa, the Tainos said, hence the term canoe. And then what about those weird weeds that you smoke? Tobacco. And what about that piece of cloth that you sleep in? A hammock. And those powerful storms that hit the Caribbean in the summer and the fall? Huracan, hurricane. And what about those meats that you smoke over an open fire? Barbacoa, barbecue. So you use a lot of tiny words every day without knowing it, especially when you're having a a lazy day smoking tobacco while reclining on your hammock while waiting for your barbecue to be ready. Taino Heritage Day. But back to our narrative. As I mentioned earlier, the Taino farming system, that was so effective that the Tainos had plenty of free time, and they used much of that time for socializing. 
the island of uh, Hispaniola, which corresponds to today's Haiti and Dominican Republic, that was divided between five main Taino kingdoms, each of them ruled by kings that were known as caciques. The Tainos tended to be peaceful, so disputes between those caciques were generally ironed out through diplomacy rather than war. Uh, the Tainos would organize big gatherings, which involved ball games, feasts, as well as aretos, so stage plays, and then work things out. Religion also occupied a good deal of their free time. The Taino religion was polytheistic, like most of the religions we've encountered in the class, and it also featured shamanistic practices similar to what we saw among the, the Mongols or Sub-Saharan Africans. So you had only men and women, the shamans, uh, who would be tasked with communicating with the gods by entering into a, a trance. And to do so, the shamans would first purify themselves inside and out, which meant, uh, sorry for the details, but emptying their bowels, urinating, uh, but also inserting a long stick inside their throat until that sparked a gag reflex and the shamans puked out the whole breakfast. Yep. And once they were adequately purified, the shamans would then start smoking tobacco and probably some other stuff mixed in too, since they would then have visions of the gods. Maybe they put pot in there. After all, ganja is still a big part of the Rastafarian religion of Jamaica to this day. Anyway, once they got into a trance, the shamans of the Tainos would then start talking to the Zemis, Z-E-M-I, which were a physical representation of the gods. Think of statues made of stone or wood or bone. Uh, the Spanish destroyed many of these pagan idols, the Zemis, after the conquest, but enough of them have survived uh, that you can find Zemis in museums all over the world today. In fact, uh, the Zemis, or statues of the gods, uh, they are the main physical remnant of that lost Taino culture today. Again, though, take everything I say about the Taino religion with a grain of salt. My main source is Catholic priests, who had a vested interest in describing the Taino religion as silly and wrong-headed, since they had come to the Caribbean to convert all these heathens to Christianity. Uh, so there's probably a lot that we don't know. Another trope in Spanish writings was infantilizing the Tainos to treat them as children. And the Spanish often depicted the Tainos, who didn't know about writing or about mythology, as childlike and ignorant, i.e. empty vessels uh, that were ripe for the civilizing influence of the Europeans. And so that was the beginning of the concept of the noble savage, the ignorant, free-living native who was uncorrupted by civilization, and that trope would pop up again when the Europeans got to Polynesia in the 18th century. So for Europeans who viewed the world through the prism of the Bible, the Caribbean islands were kind of Garden of Eden, and those half-naked Taino, they were Adam and Eve right before the fall, which they were. The Tainos were also described as childlike and innocent because they didn't fight back against the Spanish, at least initially. So by contrast, the other indigenous people of the Caribbean were depicted in a much more negative light by the Spanish. These other people are known as the Caribs. And by the way, the naming of ethnic groups, that's a contested issue in the Americas. Many Native Americans resent the term that is used to describe their group because that name was often imposed by outsiders at the time of the conquest, and that name is not always accurate or flattering. I already told you how the term Taino, that came from a misunderstanding. While the term Carib, that comes from the Spanish word for savage, which is hardly flattering. Uh, but that's how the Spanish viewed the Caribs as savages. And Carib, that's also the root word for the term cannibal, caribal, uh, because the Spanish, they accused the Caribs of eating human flesh. So that's what the term Carib meant to the Spanish. These are man-eating savages. So in that sense, the Caribs would be representative of a different trope in European colonial writing, not as the noble, savage, childlike, and peaceful like the Tainos, but the violent savage, the cannibal, who refused to be conquered, the Caribs. So the Caribs were also known as the Carinago today. They came from South America, just like the Tainos, and they migrated north along the island of the Antilles, just like the Tainos had done. Uh, they were far more warlike than the Tainos, so they pushed them away as they made their way north from one island to the next. So by the time Columbus arrived in 1492, uh, the Caribs occupied all the small islands of the Leicester Antilles, 
and they were re regularly attacking the larger islands of the greater Antilles to the north, uh, where the Tainos lived. Uh, the goal was to seize captives, uh, especially brides. So the Caribs' skill in combat, that probably explained why the Spanish disliked them. They refused to be conquered. And also the Caribs lived in small islands of limited financial value, uh, so Europeans didn't con conquer them at first. And the Caribs managed to retain their hold on those Carib islands well into the 1600s. And that's the reason why the whole region, the Caribbean, was eventually named after them, the Caribs. They stuck around much longer than the Tainos did. The Caribs were even able to maintain a few distinct communities all the way to the present time in Dominica, for example. And there's also a community of black Caribs called the Garifunas who live in Central America. They are the descendants of uh, runaway African slaves who were intermingled with Caribbean communities. And I'm always fascinated by communities like that who are the embodiment of the events that I teach about in my classes. Uh, they remind me that history is a living thing, not just some stuff that happened long ago in the past. Speaking of history, let's move on from prehistoric times, when writing did not exist in the islands of the Caribbean, among the Tainos and the Caribs, to historical times, when literate people, i.e. the Spanish, showed up on the scene. And that dividing line would be 1492, the year that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, the second half of my world history survey begins with the colonization of the Caribbean, so I will have multiple other video lectures that deal with that period in the other half of the survey. Today, I just want to mention a few key points, especially as they pertain to the fate of the Tainos, and kind of leave it there for now. So let's start with the classic question. What prompted Columbus to set sail across the Atlantic into the unknown? When we studied the Portuguese exploration of Africa, I mentioned the three Gs, gold, God, glory. That was the main motivating factors. Well, that's also true here. And by gold, I mean profit in general. Uh, so specifically, Christopher Columbus, he hoped to find a sea route to India and East Asia so that he could buy spices and silk on the cheap by bypassing the Silk Road, just like Vasco da Gama. And since the Earth is round, he hoped that he could reach the East by sailing west, which was a good idea, except that unbeknownst to, me, to him, uh, the Earth was much bigger than he expected and the Americas were in the way. So when Columbus realized that there were no spices in the Caribbean, because of course he was not where he thought he was, well, he switched to any other potential source of profit that he could find. Maybe enslaving the Tainos that he encountered. Maybe bring them back to Spain as captives in an early form of the Atlantic slave trade. Maybe exploring gold mines in the Caribbean. Maybe introducing new crops to the Caribbean and then cultivating them. And he tried all of that, but generally his various schemes were a financial failure. So his voyages were not as rewarding as those of Hernan Cortes or Francisco Pizarro, uh, the conquistadors that we encounter in the next two lectures. The second G, glory, that also played a role. Columbus was not some fancy Spanish novel. In fact, he was not Spanish at all. Uh, he was a merchant from Genoa in Italy. Not poor, but not highly ranked either. Otherwise, well, he would never have left Europe. So a lot of the conquistadors that we will encounter in that section were just like him. Restless young men of middling rank who dreamed of bigger things and could not achieve those bigger things back in Europe. So when Columbus hired himself out to the Spanish monarchs, he asked to be named Viceroy of whatever land that he would find. This way his sons would inherit his title after him and if he were successful and he conquered an empire, then he could hope to create a great dynasty of nobles. Glory. Of course, making a buck and flattering one's ego, that doesn't sound too good. It's self-serving. So if you read documents by Columbus, so his Spanish bosses, the one factor that they featured more prominently would be the last G, God. They were ostensibly trying to spread the word, capital W, and convert heathens to Catholic Christianity. Though, of course, one can always be cynical and wonder if the conquistadors were really devout Christians or just hypocrites who were just trying to justify some land grab by calling it a divine mission. I'd like to be the judge of that. We encounter the same kind of dilemma when we studied the Crusades and we tried to figure out the motive of the Crusaders. So people do things because they want to, the three genes, but also because they can. 
And the European age of exploration was made possible in part by innovations in maritime technology, some of them of Chinese and Arabic origins, uh, which would be including the compass, uh, the stern post mounted rudder, and the Latin sail, which made it possible to navigate far from the shores of Europe into the Atlantic. And all of these inventions came together in the caravel, the small, sturdy, versatile merchant ship uh, that was used by the Portuguese around Africa and then Spanish explorers across the Atlantic to the Americas. So the three Gs and the caravel. With these tools, Columbus did four voyages in all. Uh, the first and more famous one uh, reached its climax on October 12, 1492, when Columbus landed in what is today the Bahamas in the Caribbean. And that's why this day is now listed as Columbus Day on your calendar. And why every year on October 12th there are controversies over whether this should be a holiday at all, given the ruthless treatment of the Tainos by Columbus. And the fact that, that uh, Native Americans, and also the Vikings, discovered the Americas long before Columbus did. I won't go into this today, so instead I'll let you tear each other apart in the comments section. But I do want to mention one thing. Columbus is a good example of a concept that I covered in the lecture of Mali. Historiography. How our vision of the history, that can change over time. Either because we discover new sources or because we take a second look at existing sources. As such, the sources on Columbus are pretty set in stone. We are not discovering new documents on his first voyage that would force us to take a second look at his accomplishments. What has changed over time has been our view of race and colonialism. Because initially, Columbus was seen as a great European hero who brought civilization to the savages of the Caribbean, Tainos and Caribs. But then in the 1960s, as historians became more mindful of the negative impact of the European conquest of the Caribbean, and also more respectful of other cultures like Native Americans, those historians became more critical of, historic, of uh, historical figures like Columbus, who were once lionized in the history books. So hence the complete 180 for the reputation of Columbus. And that would be true of other conquistadors that we'll study in this section, like Arnold Cortes or Francisco Pizarro. You will find old statues of them all over Spain and America, but also plenty of liberals and Native Americans who now want to tear down those statues because they honor a terrible people. So history, that's a living saying, a contested field, a political battleground. And if you live in the U.S. South, you're probably familiar with similar controversies over statues and who we should celebrate as a society, including uh, Confederate generals. Speaking of heroes and villains, let's introduce another controversial figure from that era, Bartolome de las Casas. He was a Spanish priest who lived in the Caribbean right around the time when Christopher Columbus and his Spanish patrons conquered and colonized the area, i.e. around the early 1500s. Las Casas, he was initially supportive of the Spanish colonial effort. After all, he was Spanish and he was a devout Catholic. Also, he owned an encomienda, which was a system, also known sometimes as a repartimiento, and that was similar to the feudal system that we studied in Europe in section three. Under that repartimiento system or encomienda, European colonizers like Columbus, or later Las Casas, they would be given a tract of land with the Tainos still living on it, and those Tainos would then become like serfs, if you will. The Tainos would give free labor for part of the year to the Spanish lords, the encomenderos, in exchange for protection, just like in feudal Europe. And that encomienda system was supposed to be paternalistic. The Spanish lords would act like stern fathers who could punish the Tainos if they strayed, but they would also care for the Tainos and instruct them in the Catholic faith as if they were their children. But the reality was quite different as Las Casas soon discovered when he got to the Caribbean. The Spanish lords were purely focused on short-term profit, especially gold mining, so they exploited the Tainos mercilessly. And if the Tainos dared to complain about the treatment, they were tortured, maimed, or just killed outright. And then, when there were not enough Tainos alive in an island, the Spanish would then attack other islands in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, uh, to seize even more laborers and exploit them back in Hispaniola. So Las Casas was so horrified by what he saw in the Caribbean that he quit his encomienda. He became ordained as a priest, and he dedicated the rest of his life to documenting the abuses against the Tainos. So he's one of the first historians of the Caribbean. 
but one who, very unusually, took the side of the victims of Spanish rule, the Tainos, even though he was Spanish himself. Las Casas, he eventually published what he witnessed in a book called A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, uh, which is a key source for us historians today. That book, though, is not easy reading. It consists of one horrible anecdote after another. I'll just mention one of his anecdotes, which involves Ana Kawana, a noble lady uh, of Taino descent, uh, who came from the class of the caciques, the Taino kings of Hispaniola. She was a sister of one king and the wife of another, as I recall. According to Las Casas, Ana Kawana, she was a gentle figure who welcomed the Spanish and would happily have put herself under the gentle supervision of the Catholic monarch of Spain, and she even invited all of the local Taino nobles to her mansion, her hut, so that they together could greet the incoming Spanish. At which point, uh, the Spanish conquistador surrounded the hut and set it on fire, burning all of, all of the Taino nobles of the island alive. And then they hanged poor Anacahuana for good measure. So much for welcoming the Spanish. So that's pretty much the story of her life. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about her, I'd suggest listening to the show I did on her for the University of Radio. She was really a sad but fascinating figure and a good example of the, the shock of the conquest as experienced by the Taino people. Anacahuana, she was just one of many victims of the Spanish conquest, so much so that if you travel to Haiti or the Dominican Republic today, Hispaniola, you won't encounter any Taino people, only descendants of the French and the Spanish colonizers or of the African slaves who were brought in at a later stage to replace all the dead Tainos on the mines and on the plantations. The Tainos essentially went extinct as a people, except that a few of them intermarried with the Spanish conquerors or were raped by them. Uh, so some of their genetic material is still around today, but essentially they're gone. The horrors described by Las Casas, they have led many scholars to describe the conquest of the Caribbean as a form of genocide. That term, genocide, that's a loaded term. It goes back to the Jewish Holocaust in World War II. And the legal definition is quite specific, but basically that involved the willful destruction of a people based on a racial or religious grounds, like the, the Holocaust of the Jews in World War II. Las Casas, in his book, essentially describes Spanish policies as genocidal. When you read his book, it sounds like the goal of the Spanish was to kill all the Tainos of the Caribbean out of sheer blood lust. I tend to defer with that assessment, at least when it comes to motive. The Spanish, however cruel, were not trying to wipe out the Tainos. They wanted to tax them and exploit them, so they had to be alive. The Spanish happened to kill all the Tainos, in part due to wanton cruelty, but also, and mostly, by unwittingly spreading new diseases. This takes us to the concept of the colonial exchange, which is probably the single most important term that you'll learn in this section on Latin America around 1500. That term, colonial exchange, that refers to the exchange of crops, animals, and diseases across the Atlantic in the aftermath of the first voyage of Columbus in 1492. It's as simple as that. But it has some very important ramifications. You see, because the American continents were so isolated from the rest of the world until 1492, a unique ecosystem had evolved there. So the Americans had some crops like corn and potatoes and tomatoes that were unknown elsewhere. But the Americans also lacked other crops like wheat and rice and oranges and sugarcane and bananas, which existed in Eurasia and Africa. So when the Spanish returned from the Caribbean, they brought back samples of all the American crops that they thought might be useful back home, like corn and potatoes, which did well and led to a population boom in Europe and China after that. And then the Spanish introduced new crops uh, from Eurasia and Africa that completely transformed the economy of the Caribbean. Coffee, that would be now a key crop in Colombia, or bananas in Guatemala, or sugarcane in Cuba. All of these were not native to the Caribbean area. They were introduced by the Spanish. All of this geoengineering may sound great, but the Spanish also introduced new diseases, which was not part of the plan. The Americas were remarkably free of contagious diseases prior to the European conquest, probably because there were few barnyard animals in the Americas. 
uh, a lot of the viruses jump from one species to the other when they live in close contact, which Native Americans didn't do. So when Columbus and other Europeans came to the Caribbean, they brought with them Eurasian diseases like smallpox, the plague, measles, and also African diseases later on like yellow fever and malaria. So those diseases then ravaged the Native American population, which had no built-in immunity because of their centuries and millennia of isolation. So by emphasizing that most Native Americans died of European diseases, not Spanish seal, I'm not trying to rehabilitate the memory of Columbus. He did some pretty awful things either way. But, and that's an important but, I don't think that it was his plan to wipe out the Taino population entirely. He, quote unquote, only wanted to enslave them. He just ended up killing them all by accident. Uh, which is why I would not use the term genocide personally. I'll let you ponder the matter on your own. There's far more to say about all these difficult issues. Again, if you want to learn more about the long-term consequences of the Spanish conquest and the Colombian exchange in the Caribbean, such as, well, the Atlantic slave trade, which was designed to secure laborers for all these new sugarcane and coffee plantations after the Tainos died, well, you will need to watch the videos for the second half of the course. You'll get to that in a bit. In the meantime, well, let's just recap a few key points that we covered today because they will come up again when we study the history of Mexico and Peru. One, the Tainos of the Caribbean had a thriving civilization which lacked modern technology but was able to sustain a large population. Two, the voyages of discovery were motivated by the three Gs, with gold being at the top of the list, at least in my humble assessment. Three, the European conquest was made possible by superior technology like guns and steel, as well as disease. Four, uh, the conquest led to types of forced labor like repartimiento, as well as new diseases, which completely devastated the Taino world. So that was the template set in the Caribbean in 1492, and the story will unfold in remarkably similar ways when we get to the much larger empires of the Aztecs and the Incas. But that's a story for another day. Au revoir, and see you next time.